Next up is the State Federal Relations Committee. And although it doesn't pack the force of law, H.R. 23, declaring a supranational government such as a North American Union unconstitutional, would certainly send a strong message. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm Representative Dan Itza. I represent Rockingham County District 9. I brought this resolution in because I've been greatly disturbed by the articles I've seen in the newspaper promoting a uh, closer and closer, progressively closer union of the countries of North America, Mexico, the United States of America, and Canada. And in looking back at the history of our state and of our nation, I find what's being proposed to be uh, flat un unconstitutional. Um, the Constitution for the United States of America does give the um, general government the authority to negotiate treaties, but if you go back and you look at what the word treaties meant, especially at the time it was put in, it means an agreement uh, between nations for trade uh, or peace or alliance. And none of those uh, definitions uh, would extend, extend it to the creation of a new government. And certainly there is nothing in the Constitution that authorizes the general government to submit us, its citizens, to other jurisdictions. Uh, it's important to realize that, or to remember that we existed as a state prior to the United States of America, and we considered ourselves to be a sovereign and independent state. And we said so uh, twice in our Constitution, once in our Bill of Rights, and then also in our form of government. And after we ratified the Constitution for the United States of America, which we were the deciding vote, or we were the ninth state to ratify it, uh, we did do some amendments to our Constitution. We changed president to governor, things like that, to make ourselves consistent with the new arrangement. But we kept our self-description as a free, sovereign, and independent state. So it's very clear what our founders had in mind. And therefore, I want to make it clear to the government of the United States of America that they don't have the authority to delegate our sovereignty, even, even the sovereignty that we have delegated to them, because we, we did delegate some of our sovereignty to, to them. They don't have the authority to further delegate it to somebody else without asking us. Um, and, and that just begs the question of if somebody can take any portion of your freedom, whether you've given it to them to use or not, and give it to somebody else without so much as a buy your leave, are you truly free? And the answer is, of course, no. And if, if the general government believes that they can give away our sovereignty to somebody else without even asking our permission, uh, then we're not free. And I believe we are, and I believe we need to uh, state it now, because in the, in the general nature of things, uh, you, have to, you have to draw your line in the sand well before you get there. Otherwise, you, you really don't have the, uh, the right to stand behind it. You have to apprise the other parties. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Representative Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Bitson. Um, are you envisioning a economic trade union, union like um, European trade union, or are you that thinking is, about CAFTA and that type of thing? I am really more thinking along what we have seen develop in Europe in the, in the nature of the North American Union that has been uh, openly stated at times by the individuals um, um, promoting such an idea. It's gone from NAFTA to the security, I say it out here, uh, security partner, prosperity partnership of North America, 
and then to morph into something uh, even more uh, extensive and tight, such as the North American Union. There are even uh, discussions of some, a common currency. And uh, I, I don't, I just flat don't believe that they can do it without a constitutional amendment, and that would require ratification by three quarters of the states. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I was thinking whether I was or not. I would pop in my head was a joke that we had with Frank Amaro, the with his last name is on um, this here was called the new dollar was going to be the Amero or something or the Amero. Is that yeah. true with this here? That, yes. That's that's the uh, sometimes seldom openly but often privately uh, espoused belief. Yes. Yeah, I, we addressed a lot of this here in the National Constitutional Issue, and, and I think this is already in the, the Constitution, so I think it's a win-win for us to stand up. I want to draw the line in the sand now. Right. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, good morning. Members of the committee, uh, I was filling out my card, the card there, and I was saying, who am I representing? Self. Not only myself, my children, my four children, my ten grandchildren. This is a very awesome time in history that really what we do today is going to affect what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, in uh, trying to convince you folks that uh, the advisability of, uh, you know, ratifying or uh, voting yes on H.R. 23, um, I beg your attention to history. Uh, Patrick Henry said many years ago that I have but one lamp to guide my feet, and that is the lamp of experience. I know no way to judge the future except by the past. And uh, I'd like to pose the question, uh, you know, will historians in the future look back and conclude that what Hitler's war machine could not do to the continent of Europe, the European Union will have done to uh, you know, accomplished without a shot being fired. And uh, closer to home, uh, I think, or will they conclude that the, the North American Union did what Stalin's communism could not do, cause the death of our nation? Uh, I'm firmly in, in agreement with Lord Acton, uh, who, who said, Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I advise here that blind trust is not our friend. I think we, uh, okay, yeah, I think I'll skip a lot of this because I don't want to be redundant. Uh, okay, uh, perhaps we're getting only half the truth. Uh, isn't it strange that our print and electronic media seem to the allies with the presidential campaign and all their uh, silence about this attack on our sovereignty by the North American Union and the Security Prosperity Perimeter well, Partnership. Uh, James Madison in 1825 uh, exposed the dangers of limiting knowledge to people. And he said a diffusion of knowledge is the only guardian of true liberty. Formerly, the Bush administration had denied this, but after a meeting in uh, Banff, Canada, between December 12th and 14th, um, with high-profile leaders of uh, the Mexican and Canadian government behind closed doors, after leaving the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, Thomas Shannon, stated um, the North American Forum is a parallel structure to the Security Prosperity Partnership of North America. Okay. The Constitution gives uh, treaty power with these words in Article 6, Paragraph 2. I quote, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, the very important laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, 
shall be the supreme law of the land, and judges in every state shall be bound thereby. The reason I emphasize the United States is these treaties were made prior to the Constitution. They applied to the Articles of Confederation. Constitutional expert Roger McBride, which I have his book here, Treaties versus the Constitution, wrote and written in 1956. Uh, he, uh, he offered some observations, including what I've just mentioned about the Articles of Confederation. Number one, it mandated that the states were bound to treaties made by the national government under the Articles of Confederation. Two, it was intended to subordinate the states to national acts of power in which they were given sole voice. Number three, treaties are to be the supreme law of the land if under the authority of the United States. Articles of Confederation, because treaties made under the Articles of Confederation could not be described as made in pursuance of the Constitution. And four, from the history of Article VI, the Constitution did not affirmatively state that treaties are to be considered on the level with the Charter itself. The father of our Constitution, James Madison, made it crystal clear, I do not conceive that the treaty power is given to the President and the Senate to dismember the empire or alienate any great essential right. I do not think the whole legislative authority has this power. Does this not expose the unconstitutionality of the SPP, the North American Union? Joseph Story, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, appointed in 1811, he serves 34 years. He made this evaluation. A treaty to change the organization of government or to annihilate its sovereignty, to overturn its republican form or to deprive it of its constitutional powers would be void because it would destroy what it was designed merely to fulfill, the will of the people. Could this not be the the NAU he's talking about, the North American Union. In the 1950s, Secretary John Foster Dallas, Secretary of State in the Eisenhower administration, he was a charter member of the Council on Foreign Relations, founded in 1921. He had this to say, treaties are more supreme than ordinary laws, for congressional laws are invalid if they do not conform to the Constitution. Whereas treaty law can override the Constitution, for example, can take powers away from the states and give them to the federal government or to some international body, and they can cut across the rights given to the people by the Bill of Rights. My friends, this has been the fraudulent authority behind many wars and many trade agreements. Would you have remained silent if you'd have heard this? It is unbelievable that this perversion of our Constitution has for most, the most part stood unchallenged since then by our judiciary. For it has been the authorization for our war in Korea where American tro troops were sent to battle in what was called a police action, authorized by a vote of the Security Council of the United Nations. Remember, the UN is a treaty. We went to war in Vietnam, honoring our commitment to the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CEDO, a regional agency of the United Nations set up under Article 52 of the UN Charter. And in Iraq, Congress voted to give President Bush the power to enforce UN Resolution 1441, the above perversion of treaty power has negated congressional power to declare war, given in Article 1, Section 8. Add to this these so-called free trade agreements, NAFTA, CAFTA, GATT, the World Trade Organization, the Security Prosperity Partnership, the North American Union, and there's many, many more. And we, as a nation, are entangled in what our founders warned us against. Congressional, direct, imagine, congressional dereliction of duty hires 
foreign, unaccountable bureaucrats that do the job that they are supposed to do, regulate trade and commerce. That's from Article 1, Section 8 also of the Constitution. An uninformed electorate co has co-authored this agenda of betrayal by apathetically ignoring executive, legislative, and judicial compromises of our Constitution. We need to start this 1,000-mile journey with one step to restore the supreme law of the land to be the Constitution of the United States. In the 1950s, congressional opposition rose to this perversion of Article 6. Uh, Senator John Bricker from Ohio introduced what was called the Bricker Amendment. And all through the 50s there were fights, but finally the Eisenhower administration uh, put the squash to it. Plus the Secretary of State was John Foster Dallas, his Secretary of State. Uh, this amendment stated simply that the Bill of Rights and other constitutional provisions were under no circumstances to be overridden by any treaty I believe that we must go back to the wisdom of our founders. Washington said, it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. And Jefferson, his statement was, commerce with all nations, alliances with none, should be our motto. And I say down with the North American Union and up with the United States of America independence now and independence forever, and up with another Bricker Amendment. May God continue to bless America. Thank you. Any questions? If, um, if I take your, your argument <clears throat> one step farther and go to Jefferson and go to Washington and we decide <clears throat> under strict interpretation that the United States enters into no treaty whatsoever because every time we enter into a treaty, a treaty is like a corporation or partnership, you're going to give up some stuff to gain something. And a lot of people would say the reason World War II started was because, and part of the Depression was because we believed in total isolation. And if we don't have manufacturing jobs and we don't have a lot of things that we produce in the United States, how does the United States maintain its strength in total isolation? Free enterprise. Uh, we need to start being self-sufficient uh, in our energy industry. Uh, we need to stop uh, being Santa Claus to the world. How many hundreds of billions of dollars have we given around the world that's robbing money out of your pocket and my pocket? There's no constitutional provision for foreign aid. If it was in the Constitution, I would be for it. But these nations, and I'm, I'm compassionate, but I'm compassionate with my own money. I give to my own charities, but I don't want to give, you know, because somebody forces me to give. That's not charity. That's forced government stealing. Uh, uh, how do we uh, remain, you know, I don't have the, all the answers. I've been punching a time clock all my life. I'm 71 years old, and this thing has been bugging me for a long while. And uh, I think we can do better if we, if we take American ingenuity that cranked up for war and defeated the Axis powers, Japanese Empire in the Second World War, went to the moon in 1969. We have brilliant men in this nation. But it starts in our public school system, which is grossly being perverted into uh, a dumbed-down uh, uh, excuse. And it's government education. It's not public education. We don't get any of the wisdom that the founders put in the Federalist Papers. They wouldn't know what it was if you ask them, and most adults would. It's an educational problem. We need, uh, you know, I don't have all the answers, sir, but... Uh, I know that we can do better than, you know, if they're going to, uh, you know, have treaties and allowances, let's make it a constitutional, uh, you know, authority that recommends them, not a perversion of the Constitution.
I agree wholeheartedly that we as the United States need to be much more self self efficient and um, self reliant. But I always have another belief is that mostly everybody wants their half of the pie before they're willing to share the other half. And if I look every month, 50, 60, 70 billion dollars of American money, American asset goes overseas in there, we are now almost in a position is our monetary system is totally dependent on whether they want to give us our money back. Yes. Right. Now, whether Red China only wants to um, you know, uh, keep holding all the U.S. dollars they have. Last I looked, we were $890 billion in deficit to the Red China. They can almost buy our nation um, because that's the danger of this, this agreement. It, you know, it's going to be a funnel for uh, slave labor goods to come from South America. Uh, I'm told that the, the American ports, with this uh, new highway uh, corridor, 1,200 foot wide, uh, our, our uh, ports are so overloaded with backup of slave labor goods, I like to call it slave labor goods because most of the time that's what it is, that if the ports could handle a lot more if they weren't backed up so far. We have a lot more deficit to Red China. How much stuff can we use in the United States? We need to start making things for ourselves. Uh, you know, I don't know where that's an answer to you. Uh, I'm an angry man. Maybe I'm the last angry man. I hope not. Yeah, but not the last. But we in America want those three, four thousand dollar white screen TVs to watch Super Yeah, Bowl. yeah, that's I true. Know. I don't know why. They <laughs> yeah. Only when the pictures. I don't have no clip for this. I, I was in here earlier and I said on the front desk. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and honorable members of the board for this opportunity to testify. I just want to say something in relation to the chairman's question on isolation. The free trade area of the Americas included all countries in this hemisphere, but who did they isolate? Who were they isolationists against? Cuba. So, you know, we, we can trade with China, but we didn't want to trade with Cuba on the free trade areas of the America Treaty, which never got passed. Can I leave this <coughs> here with you? This uh, DVD was produced in Merrimack, New Hampshire, on public cable access. It's uh, Janine Nada, who has a program chatting with Janine, and I was her host on that program, and we interviewed a top member uh, or a, a person who was very familiar with the North American Union. I wish you would take a look at that. Uh, this other DVD, is a case for blocking the NAU. In it has the interviews that Lou Dobbs uh, was involved with um, <clears throat> the, the person that actually wrote the North American community, uh, Robert Pastor of the Council on Foreign Relations. So he's interviewing him, asking him about the North American Union. You will find that very informative. And, and I'd like to leave you with uh, this, this to ponder. <clears throat> Here is a book. It's called The Great Deception, Can the European Union Survive? And I made note of it here on my literature. It's written by Christopher Booker and Richard North. And it goes through the history of how the European Union was perpetrated on the Europeans. And it's, it's awful tough reading. I'm all three quarters of the way through, and it's brutal. But I, so I just left the reference here in case you wanted to get it out of your library. And I have some pamphlets on the... North American Union. I'd like to leave those. And here's some just single paper issues here. A letter uh, from Charles Fowler of, of Toledo saying, U.S. going the way of the European Union. You might look at that. It's, a, it's kind of brief. And then the NAF are the NAFTA trade corridors real? And don't forget, the North American Union has not been put in any formal nature at, as we speak. But neither was the, not, neither was the European Union. As we outlined, uh, as this book outlines, it was started off with a little Europe, uh, coal and steel community, then it started to morph to a, a community, then to a, a union, etc. So the DVDs here and the literature will give you some excellent information, and I appreciate the opportunity for to testify. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sir, since you're plotting through the Great Deception, um, from what you have read and what you have thought about, 
which, uh, which country benefits most from the European uh, common market? Which country of the European? Union now, I guess is what they're called, yeah. Well, I think that is still to be written, isn't it? Because since they haven't, once they formulate their government and get rid of the constitutions of their countries, uh, then I think the future is, will be a decision as whether going to a world government, which is what they're really basically doing, a world government of Europe. The insiders have said, listen, well, you heard uh, my testimony before when I mentioned Vincente Fox. He says, I'd like to see the, North, uh, the United States go the way of the European Union so that we would merge and then join. So, but I don't know, I couldn't answer that question as who benefits most. You know? Well, I'll answer it for you. France, okay. France does. Um, okay. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair? Yep. Um, I, I guess I have some confusion with uh, trades as far as uh, goods type of trading for the benefit of the whole as opposed to um, what I, I think I'm hearing is um, having a single governance. Um, after the Second World War, uh, we had the Marshall Plan where we helped Europe. And um, then the common union, where, which had to do with, with commodities and subsidies. I mean, Europe is not very big. If you've traveled through Europe, you know, they don't understand when they come to this country that, um, you know, you can't do uh, New York on Monday, except if you're a candidate, I guess. You can't do New York on Monday, <laughs> Chicago on Tuesday, uh, Florida on Wednesday, that type of thing. So, um, I understand the logic of what they've done as far as with trade and, 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 and commodities and that. So my question and my confusion lies in, are you saying that by us, such large countries, Mexico, the United States, and Canada, that we're trying to form one government or one trading bloc? Well, okay, that in the Great Deception, the European Union started with these just the six nations and they were only going to regulate or have a bill uh, working on coal and steel. That's how they started. They said, that's all we'll do. We'll just kind of, well, if we're all producing the same steel, then maybe we won't use those for armaments. Maybe that was their idea. But basically the idea was written far, we'd have to go in, in depth in this book. But the idea was, hey, if we're going to to go around the, the structure of Europe and mold it to our desire, we have to formulate a plan. And the plan was to start off with only a three nation, uh, a six nation deal. Then we'll move on. And this book, like, it covers through that whole process, which is the same process that's going here. Now, George, President George Bush said the following. He says, on January 1st of 2005, we will have the free trade areas of the Americas secured and signed and passed. He says, nothing, nothing will stop us. He was stopped cold because now, he said, once he found out that he could not pass the free trade areas of America and exclude Cuba, he said, okay, then what we've got to do is, from the book, we've got to start a new approach. We must now uh, go to a security, prosperity, and partnership it's just like what, what uh, the Boston Globe wrote just recently. They said, hey, these people who are claiming that we're going to a North American Union are kooks. Michael Medved, Medved said the same thing. But re go ahead and, and, and check this out and see what Lou Dobbs got out of these people. You know, They never did answer his question, but I think he puts it succinctly when he says, you know, are you working towards a North American Union? Is this, what is this SPP? Now, the previous speaker, uh, Russ Payne, mentioned that in Canada, they met on this in Ban Banff, Canada, but we weren't allowed to hear about it. The news media totally blocked it up. Pretty interesting. So, it just behooves us. Now, as you know, other states are hearing these same type of thing. New Hampshire, I just put New Hampshire on YouTube via, you know, the internet is so good. I said, I mentioned the fact that this committee was hearing it. People are logging in to this committee on the web and looking to see. I, I know you won't probably get inundated with mail, but it's interesting to know that, that you're hearing this and you're going to make a decision on it. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. The, um, to, to go for a little clarification on some of your, <coughs> maybe your confusion, I don't like to use words. <coughs> In the EU, every country basically has their sovereignty, but they have an overlapping control, and I think that rotates every six months from someone to different country to quote to be the president or whatever the official title is of the EU. In the, a couple of things, like Great Britain hasn't joined the monetary one, they still keep the pound sterling compared to euro, and I think there's a couple. I think Sweden may not have gone in yet. But the, the other part of the EU, to become a part of the EU monetary system, your national deficit, each year bus deficit, is limited. And so, like for example, the United States would not be able to join the EU even if they so choose, because our annual budget deficit is far above the accepted GDP of the EU. And so, in certain cases, the EU was for trade, and the little guys like Lichtenstein and the other ones, they ended up joining because they were going to be left out in the cold in there. And so, that's part of the thing right here. <clears throat> is this a trade, or is this a sovereignty um, organization? And, that's some of the stuff when we have the executive session and we go over the materials, we'll have to discuss. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members for the opportunity. We really appreciate your concern. <clears throat> and um, this is not directed to you, but it's directed to the, the prior gentleman okay. in there. Because I have a, a wife of 32 years, three daughters and two granddaughters. America is made up of a lot of great men and women Amen. in there, yeah. just not men. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Any more? Um, I need you to fill out a pink card because I can't yeah, find this card. Right oh, actually, oh, you're holding on yeah. I'm going to close the hearing. Thank you. Any comments, sir? I think I have a ghost of a chance on this one. <laughs> Feeling feisty yet? Want to participate? Have your say? The LOB is waiting.